But when you think of bees, which bees are you thinking of? For many people, it's the industrious honeybee. But did you know that there are over 20,000 species of bees on the planet? In Canada, we have over 850 different species. And here in BC, we have 450 different species of bees. Now that's a lot of bees to have in trouble. And if those bees are in trouble, so are we. Because one out of every three bites you eat is thanks to a pollinator. And it's not just fruits and vegetables that bees help to pollinate. It's other really wondrous things like coffee and chocolate. And I don't know about you, but I do not want to live in a world without coffee and chocolate. <laughs> so why are bees in trouble? Scientists generally agree there's three main reasons. It's use of pesticides, disease, and loss of habitat. And that's something each and everybody in this room can do something about. Loss of habitat. At Border Free Bees, we've taken on this issue on a really big scale. We've been working in collaboration with the city of Kelowna and the city of Richmond to do something different. So one of the things we've done to make a difference is here in Richmond at the Bridgeport Industrial Park. Now this was a park that people tended to go to, but <laughs> they tended to go through, but not to. It's a huge park. It's a thousand feet long. That's 300 plus meters. And it sits under the flight path for a YVR airport. So it's a very, very busy place, but it didn't have a lot to offer people or bees. And one of our aims was to work with the city to change that, to make it more desirable for people to come to, and also to create a buffet of forage and flowers for bees. So what you're seeing here is a before shot. Our collaboration was with the Parks Department and the Sustainability Unit, and they were in charge of doing some of the heavy lifting, so the tilling and the preparation of the site. Our job was to design an earthwork that would attract both people and pollinators. We were supposed to design that earthwork, install it, and then do all the community programming afterwards. So this is the design that we came up with. What we created is a kind of stained glass living earthwork based on bumblebee wings. And so each of those sections is designed with flowers that are incredibly bee friendly, but they would also bloom in succession from early spring through to the fall. So how do you take a plan like this and actually make it into a living public artwork. Well, those of you who have ever done a mural, you know that you need to start with a grid plan in order to lay out the design. You also need to find somebody, in this instance, who wasn't really afraid of heights. <laughs> yes, that is me. Standing there with my hard hat and my cell phone uh, and the plan, giving instructions down to our amazing team below, who in turn had a lot of rope. <laughs> and we used that rope to lay out the bee design, the bee wing design, and then we raked it all in, hand seeded it with color-coded seed, hand raked it in with an amazing team, and then we waited. We waited for rain, we, we waited, waited for Mother Nature to cooperate, and we waited for bees. But we wanted to entice those bees. So, housing is certainly an issue in the Lower Mainland, so we thought we would provide some for the bees. And each end of the uh, thousand foot long field is anchored with a, a native apiary sculpture. And so we designed this sculpture not for honeybees, but for all those other native bees, like bumblebees, and leafcutter bees, mining bees, hairy belly bees. And we were rewarded over the course of that season of having an array of tenants checking in and out of our insect hotel. 
We also have a sister pasture up in Kelowna, which is a really amazing way to do this research because we're able to compare and contrast different ways of um, design and installation and the different regions that we're working with. And so we're able to share that information. But the other thing that we share are the artists that we work with. Here you'll see in the red t-shirt artist Samuel Roy Bois. And he's working on a community sculpture, a one-day sculpture called Small World. And it was designed to show that interconnectivity of labor, hive work, if you will, and the ways in which together we can build something in a very short period of time that we wouldn't really be able to do on our own. In this iteration in Kelowna, uh, Samuel painted the boxes so that they were in colors that were attractive to bees. But when we invited him down to our Richmond pasture, we had a little uh, something else in mind. And so he created a sculpture that was just white. And here you see it um, in preparation for installation with the community at one of our pollinator picnics. Here are the two sculptures in contrast. So the one on the top is from uh, Kelowna, the one on the bottom from Richmond. Now the afterlife of our sculpture was incredibly important. And what we had in mind was to use those boxes to work with community groups like this one here, which was the David Suzuki Foundation's Butterfly Way project, and convert those former sculptures into bumblebee houses. So people could personalize them, um, help convert them, and then take them back to their own gardens or community spots, community gardens and other greenways to install for bumblebees. And here you see one in our pasture back in Columbia. So that community engagement is really critical to our work, that hands-on engagement with people. We've also worked with other artists like Sharon Callis, who is an environmental artist based here in Vancouver. What Sharon did is she came out to our pasture in Richmond, and she put together a series of work art parties. In the first one, we helped her harvest the invasive species Himalayan blackberry, which is predominant across uh, the Lower Mainland. She then took that, that uh, fiber uh, back to her studio and processed, processed it a bit so that it was workable, and then brought it back to the pasture. And over a series of, of weeks, she worked with an uh, open kind of format where people could drop in and learn how to weave that fiber into a rope. The rope was then created, converted and created into these gorgeous butterfly net sculptures that were suspended in the trees. Now a really critical component to this is that when we were doing these work parties, people weren't just learning how to coil the rope. But they were also hearing music, they were listening to people who were telling us stories about bees, and they were listening to specialists talking about bee conservation and why bees are important. So it was a way of bringing the hand and the heart and the mind together and learning on these different levels, different ways for people to access this new information. Education is such a critical part of what we do on this project, and we are out there in all kinds of weather. We're leading groups, we're leading tours, we're doing hands-on education, and taking people on site to actually see the change that's evolving. But we're also working with local groups, and here you see the Canby eco -Sayers. So this is a group of environmentally-minded students who are just down the road at the Canby Secondary School. And in our first year, they grew a sunflower wall for us. To do that, they planted 600 sunflower seeds. So the south side of their building, every single uh, windowsill was covered with tiny little plants. And when they grew big enough, they came, brought them back up to the pasture and created this huge living wall that thrived for the entire summer. Sunflower is an incredibly bee-friendly plant. And people want to be involved. And that kind of community engagement helped to inspire this project up in Kelowna, which was the Kelowna Nectar Trail. So we were able to create an eight and a half kilometer nectar trail out of people's back gardens, front gardens, schools.
school gardens, and community gardens. But what's a nectar trail? It is that connection of foraging sites for bees so that they can collect enough food, but also to create biodiversity as they go through. Now, we were hoping that we would have at least 50 uh, willing participants, but by the beginning of the summer, we had almost 100. And these participants became our bee ambassadors. And so they, were, they would come and they would have workshops, learning about bees, learning about how to plant uh, their gardens. They'd get a bee ambassador kit, which would have a long sign that would inform their neighbors, I'm willing to talk about bees. They would also get bee-friendly flowers for their region, and they would get a bee ID book, which was another way in which they could be involved in bee conservation. Which leads us to our new app. This is a Citizen Science app Insight, and it's the first Citizen Science app for um, helping to support native bees in North America. And so this is a way that people can actively be involved in working with scientists on collecting data about how bees are foraging, what, be what flowers they're attracted to, but also the diversity that already exists in certain locations. Here are two pollinators. Are they both bees? Or is one just pretending to be a bee? They both do a fine job, but they're attracted to different types of flowers. And in our work in the field with our volunteers, we teach them how to know the difference in order to gather that data to bring back to people like uh, our collaborator, Dr. Elizabeth Alley, up at Simon Fraser University, in order to understand if we're moving in the right direction. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm an artist. But I've worked with scientists, and I've worked with other experts in the field, and they have trained me how to do this work. And in turn, I've been teaching other people how to do this work. And it's vital and important work to do, and anyone can do it. From children to seniors, anyone who's interested in being able to be part of the solution and help scientists with this really important data collection. But we can't always get people out into the pasture. And this work isn't exclusively about science. And so we figured out a way, through our exhibition, For All is For Yourself, to bring the pasture to the people. And so what we did is we created this exhibition from 10,000 laser-cut bees made from handmade seed paper. But we didn't make that paper alone. Whenever we do this project, we run a series of workshops with the community helping to make the paper. And so we use recycled paper, uh, in this case in Richmond, from here from Emily Carr. We brought paper, we brought paper from the city, and we converted that into pulp. We had over 16 different workshops where people would help us make paper, and we'd also be able to talk about seed distribution. Oftentimes people will get a package of seeds, and they'll think, oh, that's enough to cover my kitchen table, when actually it's probably enough to cover your entire kitchen. We would then take that paper back to our studio and dry it, and then take it to be laser cut. From there, we'd install the exhibition. Here it is as an installation, our second iteration in Kelowna. It is installed one B at a time. And if you're wondering how long it takes to install 10,000 bees, I can tell you it's a week, <laughs> with a lot of help. But all that labor is really worth it when people walk into the gallery and they're surrounded by the enormity of the project and the enormity of that many physical bees. 10,000 can be a very abstract number, but it's quite different when you are completely immersed in it. And the loss of 10,000 bees takes on a new and different meaning. At the end of each exhibition, we give away half the bees. And so in a way, people are able to sort of take a mini pasture in their pocket in the form of a paper bee. Each time we do the installation, again, we repeat, we repeat the process. 
And so we make paper with a new group, and we use seeds that are specific to their region. And we've taken this project now across the borders, so we are truly border free. And we have a project happening in both the US and in Mexico. So a lot of people come to me and they say, I want to help. Bees are in trouble. I'm going to become a beekeeper. And I can tell you, as a beekeeper, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard, back-breaking work. But if you have the time and the energy and the motivation, fantastic. But many of you, maybe most of you, don't. But there's lots of ways that you can actually be part of the solution. You can do simple things, like if you have a balcony, plant it full of bee-friendly flowers and pots, things like sunflower or lavender or clover. You can dedicate one square meter of your community garden or your own garden to bee-friendly wildflowers. You can make sure you're not using pesticides. You can make sure your neighbor's not using pesticides. You can talk to people about bees. You can take your smartphone and put it to work and, and join a citizen science project. Or you can start your own community project. You don't have to wait for border-free bees. You can do your own. But really, the key is that you can be a beekeeper. Just consider keeping native bees. Thank you.